Hello, Lions of Liberty fans. And you know, one great way to start out your day is with a shot of whiskey. But if you're not an alcoholic, the next best way to start your day is with an amazing cup of coffee. And now you can order coffee, delicious coffee, and also support the Lions of Liberty. We have partnered with Anarcho Coffee to create our own brand of coffee known as the Morning Roar. And let me tell you, this coffee is delicious. I am saying that as someone who just drank two cups of it before I recorded this pre-roll. So I can tell you, I'm a little hyped up, and I just had some delicious coffee. And I'd like you to be able to start your day the same way. So I want you to head over to lionsofliberty.com slash coffee. You get a 10% discount with your very first order. And if you join the Lions of Liberty Pride for $10 or more per month, which you can do over at patreon.com slash lionsofliberty, you will then get a permanent 15% discount on all future orders. And you're going to want future orders after you try this, let me tell you. But first, give it a shot. Head over to lionsofliberty.com slash coffee and start your day with a morning roar. No matter whether you're from a communist society or a capitalist society, people are inclined to be snitches. Welcome to the Lions of Liberty podcast. Here's your host, your guide, your shining beacon of liberty, Mark Claire. Heidi ho, Liberty neighbors, Liberty lovers, the Liberty adjacent. If you're listening to this podcast, you are at least have a minor concern in the ideas of liberty, unless you have tuned in completely by accident, in which case I'm, I thank you for at least listening to the pre-roll ad, and hopefully you get some delicious coffee. Nonpartisan, non-ideological coffee over at lionsofliberty.com slash coffee. But this show is, is ideological, of course. Uh, this is the show where every single Monday I interview great minds in the libertarian movement, like you will hear in today's episode, the 398th edition of this program. On a very steady approach to the 400th episode, which I've got some pretty, pretty big plans for. But I'm going to keep them in my back pocket because I like to keep you guessing But please do hit that subscribe button so you don't miss the 400th episode and so you don't miss all the great action at Lions of Liberty. Because it's not just me here every Monday. I've also got my friend and colleague, the ranting and raving Brian McWilliams, every single Wednesday, dishing his dose of comedy, culture, and liberty. I believe he's got a very interesting episode of Libertarians in Living Rooms Drinking Liquor this week with our friends Jason Stapleton and Michael Bolden of the 10th Amendment Center. Meanwhile, John Odermatt wraps things up every single Friday with his hard-hitting and inspiring look at the broken criminal justice system on Felony Friday. You can also find today's show notes over at lionsofliberty.com slash 398. Really, without further ado, I bring you today's guest. My guest today is a libertarian activist working with freedom movements in both Cuba and Venezuela. Very pleased to welcome Zach Foster. Zach, are you ready to roar? I'm ready to roar. Excellent. (laughs) Now, Zach, before we get into the awesome, awesome work you're doing in uh, a couple countries that people might not necessarily expect freedom movements in, uh, I want to get into first how Zach Foster became a libertarian. How'd you get involved with all this wacky political stuff? All right. Uh, Originally, I came from the Republican Party. I was one of the young Ron Mm -hmm. Paul militants that was pretty uh, eager and happy to work within the, the system. Um, I used to be a quote unquote minarchist back then for people who subscribe to that idea. And uh, that's kind of why I'm a little bit more tolerant of people who are not yet at quote unquote our level. But uh, the Republican Party alienated me at the same time that Dr. Paul had been opening my eyes. Uh, before that, I thought that Fox News was you know some of the most uh, intelligent, most highly informed, elevated discussion ever known to Western civilization. <laughs> yeah, I was a young Republican, Eagle Scout. Both my parents were cops. I was basically the Boy Scout uh, from the Norman Rockwell painting. Uh, except <laughs> I, for I was kind of a half-asser back then. But uh, Dr. Paul's ideas really lit a fire under me, and they significantly challenged uh, everything that I had held to be true about the world. And that was the beginning of my path to libertarianism. Also, um, a lot of Dr. Paul's teachings helped me really solidify what my values were because I thought I belonged in the Republican ranks because I'm very pro-free markets. Um, I'm very about low taxes. I'm very in favor of uh, gun rights. Um, I'm very in favor of uh, firearms as a means to empower women, um, all, all that stuff. So I really thought that I belonged with the GOP. The thing is, I really kept button heads with them on immigration and on the wars. Um, even after I became a, 
uh, a reserve soldier out here. Yeah, I, I still had that constitutionalist lean. And uh, the longer that our government got involved in these places, you know, the more disturbed I got by that. Um, and the more that I had to come to the realization that what I was doing inside of that machine as a reserve soldier and then later as a private military contractor, um, while I did, I do feel I did a lot of good, I was also contributing to a lot of things that were not good and making it possible for people to do that type of thing. So more and more, while I am very proud of the work that I did with the the medical corps of the different armed forces, there's other things that uh, I'm not entirely proud of. And uh, one of the deciding things for me, for example, one of the Iraqis who was on our side in the Iraq war and who is currently a U.S. resident, you know, he's over here now. Um, I straight up asked him, was it worth it? And he thought for a long time. And I said, was it worth the dead people? And just w without even missing it, he said no. And uh, that that meant a lot. That that really meant a lot to me. And eventually, um, a couple of years after I left the GOP formally, I, I had the courage to leave the military industrial complex and um, jumped into the Libertarian Party with both feet. And that's kind of how I started getting involved with the Cubans and the Venezuelans because from walking away from that scene, all of a sudden I had a lot more free time. I'm curious, how much did your your time in the military and in war zones affect your views specifically on, on the war issue? Was actually being there, did that did that sort of move you even more in the anti-war direction? Um, well, I just got to make one thing abundantly clear because I don't believe in stealing valor. I was not physically inside Iraq or Afghanistan. My particular work as a private contractor took me to other places uh, that I cannot disclose because of NDAs. Um, but I, I saw enough that, um, you know, the, the writing was on the wall about what's really going on. Um, matter of fact, just as an example, I was talking with another friend of mine who was an ex-Marine and he worked a lot with uh, special operators and uh, contractor guys. And we were talking about how funny Democrats and Republicans are about their different ideas and solutions for immigration and the war on drugs. You know, you got um, on the left, people theoretically favor uh, more you know, loose immigration policies, which basically that increases the supply of drugs that the cartels you know, send north, while the Democrats also maintain their little fiction over the war on drugs. So that's, that's supply. Um, and then when the conservatives are in power, they tend to have more harsh border uh, controls and um, they tend to uh, wage war more heavily on, on drugs. And that just reduces the supply and increases the demand. So this guy said, whether you're a Democrat or you're a Republican, you're a stupid fool who's working for the cartels. Because your <laughs> policies are either increasing supply or demand. And I said, oh my God, that, that that's absolutely right. I, I really, uh, so many things that I'd seen uh, working with some of the contractor teams and some of the operators that work in South America. Oh my gosh, that is absolutely the truth. Um, so it's, it's pretty absurd, but, um, it drives me crazy when I hear crime and drugs as an excuse to sort of clamp down on border movement or what have you, because then all I think to myself is just end the war on drugs, silly. Yeah. Just end the war on drugs and then, uh, uh, make a process where, uh, people can just be you know, illegally enter through the points of entry. We take their fingerprints and, and their retina scan. And if they commit crimes and they go to jail and get deported, you know? Um, everybody else just let them in. You eliminate the problem because otherwise, you know, you go for the Democrat or Republican policies. You're either supporting supply or you're supporting demand. Um, ironically, the work that I did with that uh, in those years has a lot to do with some of the work that I'm doing today. Um, and I'm, I'm going to get into that in a few minutes. But uh, uh, to put it to put it bluntly, I really thought that when I got involved with the Cuban and Venezuelan libertarians, uh, this was going to be just me doing an extension of the Libertarian Party, but in Spanish. And the level of human suffering and government oppression that's going on there, um, unfortunately, makes my job a lot closer to confessions of an economic hitman. Um, we deal with those types of goons a lot. So, yeah, it really did help. And I do feel like the Almighty prepared me with everything that I was put through in my particular time on earth so far, I'm 30 years old. Um, and I feel like if I had been addressed with some of these same issues uh, five years ago, and if I've had to make some of the same leadership decisions that I'm doing today, you know, five years ago, I, I probably would have failed um, because some of the, some of the things that I'd been through after that were absolutely necessary to really refine me, to be able to, to handle 
the type of things that we handle. I have actually interviewed uh, that you referenced there, the uh, author of that book, Confessions of an Economic Hitman, John Perkins. So I'll link to that in today's show notes for people that are, might not be familiar with the term. But um, so how did you actually get directly involved uh, with some of these countries? Uh, I believe you're, you're a consultant with the Partido Libertario Cubano, Jose Marte, that is the Libertarian Party in Cuba. So how did you first get involved with them? And I think a lot of people might be shocked to even hear that, A, that Cuba has pl- political parties at all, and B, that there is actually a libertarian political organization, uh, just, you know, regardless of how small it may be within Cuba. Well, officially, legally, the there's the Communist Party, and every once in a while in the National Assembly, um, they'll have their BS uh, uh, minority parties, but you know, they're all just fronts for the commies. Um, I, I can't name any Cuban ones uh, right off the bat, but for example, um, in, in the Venezuelan uh, Constituent Assembly, which is Maduro's rubber stamp Congress, the United Socialist Party is the overwhelming majority party, but to maintain this facade of democracy, they also have uh, the Communist Party of Venezuela and the Revolutionary Workers Party and all these other, <laughs> you know, they're all so parties different. that are just not, not, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. You can choose any flavor of totalitarian. Yeah, so, so what it is, is, you know, unfortunately, um, a lot of American libertarians have a similar status with the Cuban libertarians. They're just a bunch of dudes that got together and, you know, signed some documents and said, hey, we are the Cuban Libertarian Party. We don't care what the government says. And there's been some times in recent years where that's also been the case with uh, the Libertarian Party of Oklahoma and some of the other LPs <laughs> where, Uh, Republican controlled state governments have done everything they can to defranchise us as a party. So um, yeah, it's hilarious. Even though the Cuban government is officially communist and the American society is officially, you know, quote unquote capitalist, um, it's amazing how big government looks and acts the same a lot. The suppression of the ideas of of, of non, of nonconformist ideas is is kind of uh, universal. I did just implicitly accuse the Republicans of behaving like the communists. I think it's a fair enough accusation. Good deal. Good deal. Um, so anyway, there's just uh, some people that that formed a political party in a house one day. But the way that I got involved with these folks was uh, back in February of 2017, I was uh, surfing Facebook. I had been cruising Spanish language libertarian groups on Facebook because uh, at that point I was really done with the American Libertarian Party. I needed to go on break. Oh, I, I think if you hang around uh, libertarians enough, we all could use. Yeah, exactly. So, so I went on break, and I said, you know what? I'm gonna, you know, there's a lot of trouble going on in Latin America. I'm gonna talk with Latin American libertarians and impart my knowledge and wisdom and my years of activism and blah 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 blah. Um, and that's how this Cuban refugee in Miami who was surfing Facebook happened to have found me. I just got a random message uh, from a gentleman. I'll call him Mr. Mr. G uh, to protect his identity. Mr. G hit me up on Facebook in Spanish and he was a lot of typos. uh, And he was asking me, you know, help me, help me. Two of my friends in Havana have been arrested by state security. They're in jail now. Uh, They're libertarians and they were arrested because they're libertarians. Please help me, help me. And I asked him, uh, come again? What the hell are you talking about, brother? Slow down. You know, Give me some details. So just the way I described to you guys is exactly how it was. Uh, and what it was was a very small group of libertarians. I don't know how they, they got that way. You know, they found this information on the internet. Um, they were looking up words like freedom and democracy and you know, limited government and free markets, you know, things that they had heard whispers about over the years from different members of the Cuban opposition. Um, And just from looking at that stuff, they happened to have found some Spanish language Mises material that was translated by some of the folks in Spain uh, from the publications that they're making over in Auburn, Alabama. So this small group of, of libertarians on the island, they actually took the initiative to go learn about freedom. And that's how they independently became libertarians. I would love to be able to take credit for planting the seed of libertarianism in Cuba, but that absolutely did not happen. Uh, This small group of people wanted freedom so bad that they were looking it up and they just learned about it and they became libertarians by being self-taught. So they started this little book club. They called it the Mises Cuba Book Club, and they were literally meeting in a living room in, in a poor suburb in Havana. And uh, they've reached out to some libertarians in Spain and they sent them 
uh, some copies of, I believe, Rothbard's Ethics of Liberty translated into Spanish. And so uh, two gentlemen by the names of Ubaldo Herrera and Manuel Velasquez were uh, going to this meeting of the Mises Cuba Book Club, and they were approached by a couple of state security members who were dressed in plain clothes, civilian clothes. Now, state security, um, it's kind of Cuba's uh, equivalent of the FBI, but what they really are primarily is the political police. Now, the Mm -hmm. FBI has taken similar stances in the past. For example, um, when they've uh, carried out assassinations against Black Panther members, like Fred Hampton. But for the most part, the FBI really is an investigative and law enforcement organization with shitty priorities, but they really are a law enforcement organization. Whereas state security, they are the political police. Their primary job is to protect the revolution and their secondary job is to protect the law. So they got approached by these political police who had been watching them um, because both of them had history uh, as activists And uh, Cuba kind of is a 1984-style country, but remember, it's a third-world country. It's it's really ghetto, so instead of having cameras in every corner watching you, they can't afford that. So they'll just have a guy posted on that corner watching you because that's a lot cheaper. I mean, doesn't every neighborhood basically have people, not maybe just known guys like you're saying, but even I think there's a lot of suspicion uh, between Cubans about people just in their neighborhood who might be spying on them or reporting them to the government. Oh, absolutely. And I can confirm that there are absolutely people in every neighborhood who are recruited, sometimes often coerced by the police to, to spy on people and, and pass on information. But you know what's funny is um, – you know, you got very poor countries like Cuba, where out of desperation, people are willing to sell their soul to the Communist Party and, and sell information to the government and, and betray their activist brothers. Uh, yeah, you, know, you got a lot of people down there who are willing to be snitches because the Stockholm Syndrome is so high. But what's funny is you drive around uh, places like uh, Henderson, Nevada, uh, Beverly Hills, California. Um, Yonkers, New York, and you see all these neighborhood watch signs and you've got all these HOA groups and and you've got a lot of the the people from the wealthiest society. They're not desperate for money, but they're desperate for something to do because they don't have to, they really don't have to do anything during the daytime. So, you know, they just organize these snitch societies. And that is an example of how if people don't teach themselves about liberty and constantly Uh, exercise their freedoms like it's a muscle and that mentality of freedom like it's a muscle, no matter whether you're from a communist society or a capitalist society, people are inclined to be snitches. Hey friends, I got to take a quick pause here to tell you about another great libertarian podcast out there. It's called Free Man Beyond the Wall, hosted by the artist formerly known as Mance Raider, now known simply by his real name of Pete Raymond. And I got to tell you, Pete is a machine. This guy brings you a new episode of his own every single Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. And he has done some absolutely fantastic in-depth interviews. He's had on everybody from Ron Paul to Thaddeus Russell to Phil Labonte, the lead singer of All That Remains, a very diverse group of guests not always libertarians. He also did a great show with a Washington, D.C. insider lobbyist revealing a lot of the dirt that goes on behind the scenes in D.C. He has done so many interviews that I have just said, darn, I wish I did this one myself. So I really do want to highly recommend checking out Free Man Beyond the Wall. You can find it over at freemanbeyondthewall.com as well as iTunes, Stitcher, and all those fancy podcatchers out there. So what are some of the biggest challenges besides the fact that anyone in their neighborhood may be snitching on them uh, that the libertarian movement faces in Cuba? Right now, uh, we're kind of keeping a low, excuse me, not we, but our, our people down there, our libertarian brothers. I say we so often because we have an international team. My organization is the Mises Mambi Institute. Um, it's Cuba's Mises Institute. Uh, I'll get to why it's not just called Mises Cuba. But the, the Mambis were the guerrilla fighters who fought against Spain for Cuba's independence in the several independence wars. Uh, it took them a couple go rounds before they got it. But uh, if, if it was uh, uh, translated to English, it would be like calling it the Mises Minuteman Institute. We are a think tank. We do produce knowledge. We do, you know, make Spanish translations of uh, you know Mises and Rothbard, and we do produce original work. But we are also very much an incubator, an incubator 
for activism and action. So uh, that's, that's one of the big reasons why we got the hyphenated name. Anyway, we've got an international team. So when I'm talking about my international team's accomplishments, I say we a lot. Uh, but in the gotcha. sense of stuff that's going down on the island, that's almost entirely the Cuban libertarians, big L and small L, who are uh, just taking in the initiative to act and to exercise freedom and to act like they're free, even if the law does not permit that. When they reach out to you for help, how are you guys from – obviously, you're not in Cuba. How are you guys able to actually coordinate with them and get them help besides just the fact of you know providing literature and, and information and that sort of thing? Are you able to actually find ways to help them in their sort of struggle on the ground? Social media helps us connect a lot, but it's also not the most secure method. So um, we might meet people on social media, but then we vet them. Um, on uh, you know encrypted apps because state security has tried multiple times to infiltrate our organization, but uh, that's one of the big. You I mean Cuban state security? Like they'll actually try to join your Facebook group or something? Oh hell mean? yeah, dude! Wow. As a matter of fact, uh, we we got catfished for a few weeks by state security, and unfortunately, they did get a couple hundred bucks out of us. Uh, it was a very wow. learning experience. But yeah, we got catfished like a mofo, and uh, what really educated me. What are they? A sexy Cuban woman as the profile pic? No, 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 not at all. They've got an even. <laughs> no, I'm, I'm joking. They've got an even bigger bait. Hey, yo, I, I, I'm, I'm a Cuban doctor. I'm in this place. Um, yo, I'm, I'm proud of, of my country, but I, I'm not so proud of what I'm seeing my government doing. I have some questions about this libertarian thing. That's how they get us. And of course, you know, that, that's literally mm. the only way that you could honeypot a libertarian better than I've got questions about liberty. Right. <laughs> that is probably the number one way you could catfish a libertarian. If it was a hot chick holding marijuana, that's the only better way to honeypot it. <laughs> Wait, yeah. you want to hear answers to questions about libertarianism? How much time do you have? Yeah, that, that's the thing. They, they honeypotted us like a mofo. And uh, they didn't ask the Cubans that, you know, because because then they probably would have suspected something. They went straight to us to ask that. So we got catfished for a couple weeks. They were acting like they were Cuban doctors uh, deployed to Algeria. Um, after talking about libertarianism for a couple weeks, then uh, they start talking about, you know, um, you know, the situation here is kind of becoming intolerable. You're really opening my eyes. I want to get the hell out of here. And then, you know, we, we got kind of excited. So, we started sending them a little bit of money to, to make plans for them to get the hell out of there. But um, then other things started not adding up really fast. And as soon as they started getting the money, they got sloppy. And that's how they betrayed their cover. But the way that they got us is they actually they took the identities of four Cuban doctors who are real Cuban doctors who are, have actually been deployed to other places. For example, wow. one of the identities I can think of right off the bat um, and I apologize to this man right in the beginning. I know state security is listening, so I'm just going to tell you those SOBs. I presume they all subscribe. So The doctor is Leonel Kindalan. He has absolutely nothing to do with us. We have never met him. We have never talked to him. But state security hijacked his identity and the identity of three other real Cuban doctors um, in order to honeypot us and scam us and really try to collect as much intel as they could um, about about the organization, you know, they they really tried pushing hard for names once they started getting the first payments from us. But uh, they had ID cards, um, they had uh, you know uh, other types of documents for these people, driver's licenses from Cuba, um, selfies of them in all these places in Algeria, um, photos of their medical credentials from the University of Havana, from the University of Santa Clara. It was insane. And that's that's how we knew, oh, my God, this is a government operation because these people had all of the documents of these poor bastard doctors. Um, and I ended up once we figured out that they were state security, then we ended up working back channels and we found some real Cuban doctors from that mission, thanks to the help of some people through the island and some people in Miami. Um, that's the thing. The communists think that they can control speech. They think that they can control the flow of information, but it's so out of their control. Um, anyway, we found out and communicated. Um, it was communicated to us that, yeah, Dr. Kindalon is a real person. Uh, he has absolutely no idea that any of this is going on. 
uh, people who actually know the guy said, yeah, you know, him talking politics and ideas of freedom, that's totally not like him. He is a really timid guy, blah, 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 blah. So that just goes to show the level of psychosis. Um, also, the level the level of psychosis of the government, but also the level to which they will use and abuse and victimize their own doctors as weapons against freedom fighters on their own island. And what they were ultimately trying to, I mean, the money was a bonus for them, but they were ultimately trying to get intelligence. And that shows how psychotic these people are to shut down a pacifist book club on their island. <laughs> it would be laughable if it wasn't so serious now, and they weren't the actually thing, you know, trying to arrest was, people. For that was a big jumping off point. Um, and the big jumping off point for that is once we, the Mises Mambi Institute announced that we were uh, going to help the Venezuelan libertarians, that's when Cuban state security really upped their level of attention on us. Now, the reason was uh, these two guys got arrested. Um, I figured out this was not a Nigerian prince. None of these libertarians were asking me for a dime. They were just asking me to get involved. So I talked to the, uh, the XCOM of LP Nevada. They published a resolution condemning the arrest of these libertarians. Then like 10 other states around the country of the LP did that too. The LNC did a resolution. And then the next thing you know, uh, they founded an actual Cuban libertarian party in Havana. So we've got the Mises Mambi Institute, but we've also got the Cuban Libertarian Party going on down there. And in these days, there are other people who are small L libertarians, but very much like the American Libertarian Movement, uh, the Libertarian Party is a bunch of statists and they're not going to get involved. <laughs> so that just goes to show how in, in two years the, the movement has grown. Um, we started out as just a group of people in one house. Now there are libertarians in at least six provinces across Cuba. Um, the number of people who have been exposed to the libertarian message has reached the hundreds, and that's really cool. So anyway, the more we found out about the Castro government and all their shady operations, uh, we have we found out about how deeply the Castro government was involved in Venezuela. And that's when we said, you know what, this dictatorship is basically keeping that dictatorship afloat. Um, we, on behalf of the Cuban libertarians, are going to help the Venezuelan libertarians. So the Mises Mambi Institute reached out to Libertarian Movement of Venezuela, Mises Institute Venezuela, um, different groups of Vente Venezuela, which is a political party. Uh, basically, if the Republican Liberty Caucus was its own separate political party, separate from the GOP, that's what Vente Venezuela is. Um, and to give you an example of how far to the left Venezuelan politics has been pulled, this equivalent of the Ron Paul Republicans, you know, like, and it's really somewhere between Ron Paul Republicans and Gary Johnson. Uh, well, yeah, we believe in the free markets, not communism. Uh, and that's about it. That's as far right of a political party as there is in Venezuela. That's almost uh, further right than a political party there is in the U.S. <laughs> and that's as far right as any party has, has gone in Venezuela, which is hilarious. But anyway, I've been involved with those groups. But once we publicly announced that we were helping out the Venezuelan libertarians, state security really upped the ante. And the whole thing with uh, Dr. Kindelon and them stealing his identity uh, without him even knowing um, all that stuff, uh, that came after we made the public announcement that was naivety on our parts because when we started helping the Venezuelan libertarians, we were still in the mindset of, oh, okay, well, a lot of people are getting arrested, but you know, this is still worthwhile work, and you know, this is still basically an extension of the Libertarian Party. Um, you know, so we're going to keep doing it. We had no idea how psychotic they could be and how much resources that they could possibly throw against us. So. Um, I recently moved. Um, I had a particular place in Nevada and I went to somewhere else in Nevada uh, because unfortunately my, uh, my last address was uh, public information. I had an arrest warrant because of an unpaid parking ticket that I forgot about at the time. They issue arrest warrants for this in Nevada. Absolutely, I say that with shock. It's if I haven't heard a million you know, horror stories. It's good to Nevada's have. Nevada's got comparative freedom, but they are still statist as all hell. 
Uh, and yeah, another irony is we can thank the Republicans in, in the Nevada legislature and the Republican governor of Nevada for the, the most historic increase in taxes in the history of the state. But I digress. Anyway, uh, state security got a hold of my old address in Nevada uh, because it was public information. And that just goes to show you that these people are watching us, even the ones here in the United States who are involved because they are that demonically possessed and hell-bent on keeping control of Venezuela because Venezuelan oil is keeping the Castro regime afloat. That's the thing. You've got all these lefty Lucy, uh, you know, loonies uh, talking about uh, hands off Venezuela, which really that's just the platitude for uh, the U.S. Do not mess with the Castro and, and Maduro governments and the shady operations that they have going on there. That's really what it is. Um, so we, we really are fighting the beast. And that's why I said this is a lot more like confessions of an economic hitman than I ever could have could have imagined, because I never, ever would have believed that I would ever be on the phone with the state security agent of the Cuban government. I never believed that I would be physically telling these people, hey, you know, buddy, if you're selling out to the government, you're selling out to the cat, dude, you might as well just kill yourself. It's not going to get any better for you. You know, I, I just, d d d just do it. I mean, yeah, yeah, at least have some honor. Just kill yourself, dude. Hey, so I just, I just want to go back and, uh, and clarify. So was it actually, were there actually Cuban agents in the United States that were, were they like har actually harassing you at your address? Like, how did you find out that you're, that they had f figured out where you live? No, Cuban agents in Cuba were looking for information about me and they found my address because it's public information. And if somebody right. has uh, has had a previous arrest warrant, there's a gazillion websites where you can pay like five, 10 bucks and they'll just give you that information. Gotcha. So were you, was there any concern that they could actually take that information and, you know, somehow, I mean, do they have ways to actually like somehow physically get to you here? Is, is, I guess what I'm, obviously you don't want your address blasted out there anyway. I don't think that they would have done that. Uh, because that really would have raised uh, the spotlight on them and under the Trump government, especially after the incident with the, uh, you know, the supersonic, you know, messing with people's eardrums at the embassy. Um, if they had actually physically messed with me here, I, you know, there probably would have been consequences that they feel would not have been worth their time. Uh, but even still, that's just not a risk that you want to run because no. Uh, the Cuban government, unfortunately, learned a lot from the CIA, but they also learned a lot from the KGB. And you know, if you piss them off enough um, and they want to maintain plausible deniability, they'll just find gang members to do their work for them. Scary stuff. Yeah, you know, you can uh, approach just about anybody, say, hey, we know you got an arrest warrant for X, Y, and Z. Uh, you know, do something and we'll look the other way. So, why well, don't you tell us a little bit more about um, the history of the movement in Venezuela? Because it sounds like this there was already sort of a libertarian movement there that you ended up connected with through your work with Cuba. So, how far back does the actual um, the movement there? I guess it's called the. Let's see. Well, you can tell me what it's called because I don't have the page up. Yeah, <laughs> in, the in libertarian Venezuela. movement of Venezuela was founded in 2015. So they've been around for. Almost uh, four years. I believe it'll be four years this fall. Uh, I'm very impressed by that. But they started up, uh, it was a group of independent libertarians, small little libertarians. And Venezuelan history really started to change in 2014. Uh, 2013, Hugo Chavez kicked the bucket and uh, he had designated already Nicolas Maduro as his hand picked successor. So Hugo Chavez kicks the bucket while he's still president. Um, Maduro was named interim president because of, uh, you know, the, the death of the president. And then, uh, later on they had elections, obviously the elections were rigged so that Maduro slightly won because, uh, really the moment that Chavez died is when a lot of the opposition became active again and they made it abundantly clear. They did not want this anymore. Um, let me go back and backtrack a little bit. Uh, John Perkins yeah. talks about in 2002, uh, the CIA may or may not have been involved um, with uh, a coup that that took place in Venezuela. It only lasted about 24, maybe 48 hours. Uh, but Hugo Chavez was briefly overthrown and like they passed sweeping reforms. Um, they were going to start privatizing uh, PDVSA, which unfortunately needs to happen. Uh, but they were, you know, doing it their way, uh, not not the free market way, but the crony capitalism way. Um, anyway, 
uh, it was unsuccessful, but because he was temporarily removed from power, Hugo Chavez vowed that he was never going to allow himself to be that vulnerable again, especially because the army was not reliable during that time. Um, so what he did is he secretly founded a whole bunch of paramilitary groups across the country. They're called colectivos, which literally means collectives. And uh, the colectivos are actually neighborhoods. They're these socialist experiments, economic collectives. They have their communal councils. Um, you know, they've got their little centrally planned economies that are supposed to jive with the state central plan. Um, but it's not the stateless communism that you see in, in, in Karl Marx when he describes it in the German ideology. This is Soviet style state socialism, because even though these people are all civilians and this is theoretically civil society, all of it is being financed by the government. All of it is being financed by the government. So, ba you know, th th this is not civil society. They are basically federal contractors who are uh, the ones actually carrying out the experiments of the Bolivarian revolution. Obviously, socialism has failed miserably in that country. And uh, starting in uh, 2013, um, once the rigged elections were announced that Maduro had won, you know, the, the opposition came to the streets and uh, the protests got really serious and they got bigger and they carried out until 2014 and the colectivos were involved. And uh, activists have been protesting on and off in these big protests against the government consistently since 2014. And uh, this is absolutely nothing new. It's only that in the last year or so, the rest of the world has really taken notice. But this is the continuation of a lot of rioting and political violence and political assassinations by the government and periodic incursions by Colombian guerrillas, which are also drug traffickers and Hezbollah setting up operations inside the country. Um, doing money laundering inside and outside the country for the Maduro regime. So that's real because, to, to be honest, the cynic in me would hear the Hezbollah stuff and just think it was a neocon talking point. Oh, no, no, no. The Hezbollah stuff is absolutely real. So what is their interest in being in Venezuela? Officially, culture, and uh, there's a lot of Lebanese businesses uh, that are um, do, do business in Venezuela. But basically what it was was – after the 2002 coup, which was also a year after the war on terror started, as a giant middle finger um, to the United States government, Hugo Chavez basically embraced every government that the U.S. government hates. Or every, if not every government, then every movement. So, for example, uh, the Chavez regime and the Maduro regime have excellent ties, even closer ties with China politically than we do not necessarily economically, because uh, we buy more crap from, from the Chai Coms than the Venezuelans do, but politically, definitely. Uh, there are Chinese troops inside the country advising uh, uh, Maduro's hitmen, uh, the soldiers, I mean. And um, uh, goodness gracious, what else? They've got really warm relations with Iran. They have been helping Iran get supplies for their nuclear program. So basically every, everything a neocon a warmonger would want Venezuela to do. Yeah, Hugo Chavez actually went and embraced all of that. It's the real-life equivalent of what a neocon would dream up were they to want to invade a country, only he actually is, was doing it. <laughs> oh, yeah, the playbill that you see in Venezuela, it is absolutely John Bolton's wet dream. <laughs> Perhaps quite literally. but Yeah, but anyway, so Hugo Chavez uh, went and embraced all these groups um, – and with all these different you know, psychos operating inside the country, it's somewhere in between communist Cuba and the troubles in Northern Ireland. Sounds like a blast. Maybe too literal. Yeah, so all that stuff with the IRA and you know, all these gunfights not making it to the news all over the place. Um, you know, Military repression, crap being set on fire, decrepit infrastructure, mass protesting. Uh, yeah, it's it's definitely somewhere between communist Cuba and the troubles in Northern Ireland. So in many ways, I mean, it sounds like 
the, the situations both in Cuba and Venezuela, uh, maybe particularly for libertarian activists there, are, are, I guess, to put it very lightly, very, very difficult. So what can American libertarians or just maybe regular humans that, that hear about the plight of these people in, in Cuba and Venezuela, um, what can we actually do um, to actually help people spread the ideas of liberty, help them in their struggles? Uh, what sort of actual activism are you guys able to, to help with and can connect other American libertarians who become passionate about this stuff, maybe hear this interview, want to know what they can do to help out? All right. Well, for starters, I'm going to give the broke SOB option, um, which it helps us somewhat. Uh, we've got donation links. Um, people who can't donate to us share our links with people who can. Um, we get a lot of people talking about, well, I want to volunteer. I want to help. I just can't give you guys any money. Um, number one, honestly, if, if you're in that position, you should probably be trying to make some side income instead of trying to spend more time um, helping freedom. We really appreciate it. But um if, if, if your own bills are not being paid, you, you really can't help us that much. So share our links with the people who can. Um, you can give to our uh, organization on PayPal. We're waiting for recognition, but we have filed with the IRS uh, for tax exempt status um, as a 501c3. So anyway, but you, you can give a gift to our organization directly through PayPal at www. <clears throat> cubanlibertarians.org. That will take you directly to the PayPal page. Um, so tell people, hey, if you want to give money to the Cuban Libertarians, that gives it directly to our institute. And then from there, we commit it to different things going on in Cuba or Venezuela as we see fit. And that URL for the PayPal donation link is www.cubanlibertarians.org. Um, there's also our... Um, main uh, website for the Mises Mombi Institute, www.mises-mombi, M-A-M-B-I.org. So one more time, Mises, M-I-S-E-S, dash M-A-M-B-I.org. Share those two links far and wide with as many people as possible. Um, and that's the broke SOB option. Other than that, honestly, Unless people have a podcast with a lot of listeners um, or they can give us a lot of promotion, the only ways that you can really help these people is with money and supplies. Um, we love that uh, people are uh, ready and willing to do protests, and we love that people you know, kind of want to find a way to buy a T-shirt with their logo or something like that. Uh, but really, these people are in crisis mode with all these uh, blackouts that have been happening in the, around the country for the last month or so. A lot of people have died in the hospitals um, because, you know, the, their blood machines shut off, their breathing machines shut off, the NICU shut off, the lights shut off in the OR. Um, so you've got a lot of people just paying funeral expenses at an accelerated rate, and that's costing a lot of money. With the power outage, you've got a lot of food that people were saving has gone bad in the refrigerators. So the food crisis has gone bad for worse because they have fewer ways to preserve what they have. Um, they're spending a lot of time trying to find water. It, it's really crisis mode. So if you want to get these people back on the trenches, back in the fight for liberty, you got to give us money and supplies. Uh, there's a number of organizations that you can give uh, actual uh, uh, supplies to. For example, if you are in uh, the Las Vegas area, you can uh, talk to the managers of a restaurant called Viva Las Arepas, kind of like Viva Las Vegas, but Arepas, the Venezuelan. I get it, and I like it. Yeah, so uh, Viva Las Arepas, they get involved with different nonprofits all the time. They can send materials down there. Um, in Los Angeles, there is a nonprofit called Together in Music. I had a meeting with some of their folks yesterday, and uh, they also collect supplies to send directly to Venezuela. We're talking about vitamins, um, any kind of uh, medications, non-perishable foods, diapers. Diapers is a big one right there. There's a lot of babies with like plastic bags and newspapers for Ugh. diapers. It's just a disgrace and it's totally unsanitary. Um, but yeah, yeah, it's in crisis mode. Yeah, I think the real point is there is no shortage of supplies and money that these people can use in both situations. Yeah, exactly. So if you be and, and my organization hasn't just been helping anybody. There's been a couple of times where we've made uh, grants to uh, groups who just go to a poor neighborhood and they'll just feed all the kids regardless. We've done that whenever we can, but really our primary mission 
and our responsibility to our donors is to facilitate libertarian thought and action in Cuba and Venezuela. So we've been using those funds to keep Venezuelan libertarians and Cuban libertarians out of crisis mode. Lately, though, mostly the Venezuelans, because that crisis, unfortunately, is a lot worse. Right. Right. So Let's... one more time, if, if you guys really want to help the Venezuelan libertarians, oh my gosh, I'm going to be completely honest with you guys. Even though I run this nonprofit uh, my, for my day job, I'm a freelance writer that pays my bills. Uh, for months now, I've been I've been uh, Uber driving full time as a second job just to be able to finance all the money that we're sending down there. That's awesome. People are dying, man, and and some of our guys they're on meds, and 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 there's even other people I still can't afford to help them yet, and that bothers me. I can tell you right now, there is there's uh, uh, local leaders and 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 state leaders of uh, of the libertarian movement that have medical problems. I'm not going to name them, but one of the state leaders. Um, has a, a, a kidney problem and he doesn't have a lot of medicine um, and, and the access is horrible and there's just no money and, and he goes to bed at night feeling a swollen kidney. This dude is his condition getting a little bit worse from dropping dead, you know, and I can't afford to help him yet. And that bothers the hell out of me. So I'm imploring you guys, if you really want to help libertarians in Cuba and Venezuela and you want to not waste our time, please, we need money. So, www.cubanlibertarians.org is how you can uh, give through PayPal. And if anybody wants to give a, a Bitcoin donation, then they can go to Mises-Mambi.org, Mises-Mambi.org. And uh, on that donation page, you can find our Bitcoin wallet. So please, folks, help out because uh, uh, there's people who really need it. As a matter of fact, it, it's, it's amazing because even having unauthorized medicine it still doesn't eliminate the risk for these people. Um, there's a, a, a gal who was a state, uh, excuse me, a national chair for uh, the youth group branch of Venta Venezuela. She's done a number of charitable things um, like coordinating gifts around uh, different neighborhoods, foods and stuff like that um, to get people to listen to the political message. She's been arrested for that. It was two years ago. Um, only two months ago, there was a, a young libertarian gal. Her name was Melanie. Um, she's a nursing student, and she's got her own little foundation in Venezuela that, that we're trying to help out as much as we can. Uh, and what they do is they bring medicine to like babies, toddlers, medicine, diapers, uh, kids in the hospital, NICU, like sick babies. She actually got detained first by the army. At the hospital, by the way, like the army just walked into the hospital and detained her for for doing this, uh, handing out this this medicine, quote unquote, sabotaging the Bolivarian revolution. But they detained her. And then after they let her go, when she was leaving the hospital, the civilian paramilitary goons detained her and they were threatening her and said, you know, we're going to effing kill you, bitch, blah, 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 blah. Um, it's insane. Uh, who else? Who else? Um, Yomar. Uh, the national coordinator for the libertarian movement. When that guy goes out to hand out uh, libertarian literature at different protests, oh, hell yeah, he's always evangelizing. When Yomar goes to, to hand out libertarian literature, he's got to wear a helmet and you know mask and, and take a shield with them just because the army's launching marble bullets at people. I mean, that's, that, that's the thing. Uh, ask yourselves, everybody who's listening right now, ask yourselves as a, as a libertarian, in the case of Ubaldo Herrera, who is still in a Cuban labor prison, when is the last time you went to prison over possessing a Murray Rothbard book? Or when is the last time that the army was shooting at you for handing out libertarian literature in public? It's unbelievable. Just ask yourselves that. So Makes you realize how, how good we have it here in so many ways. As, as many problems as the United States does have, that's why we're all libertarian activists here. Uh, at least we can pretty much feel confident that we can you know hand out bo Murray Rothbard books and, and read the literature and, and not be physically assaulted. Yeah. Yeah. So, folks, please help us out uh, with, with, with money so we can make this stuff happen. CubanLibertarians.org. And if you need more information before you give, go to Mises-Mambi.org. And that's also got our Bitcoin information. So please, folks, we need help. Now. I'll link to everything. I'll link to all the PayPal links and um, every everything you've mentioned in the show notes for the show as well. So oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. One last thing also, and I'll provide you guys uh, the links for the comments. 
Um, if you want to help out the libertarian movement directly with like five bucks a month or something like that, like I'm doing, they got a Patreon account. So that's uh, patreon.com slash M O V L I B V Z L A. And by the way, M O V L I B V Z L A is their URL for all the different social media platforms. Awesome, Zach. Well, I really do appreciate you coming on and sharing this information uh, with our audience. I know there is no shortage, once again, of help that both of these movements can use. Obviously, Venezuela is in a little more of an immediate crisis, but uh, there is no shortage of help needed on the ground uh, for for our fellow libertarians. Thank you so much for the shout out, brother. Thank you so much for your help. Thanks a lot, Zach. Keep up the great work, man, and keep on roaring. I'll keep on roaring. All right. Well, I tend to believe, Zach Foster, I tend to believe that he will continue to keep on roaring out there for the causes he believes in, for the Venezuelans and Cubans out there and people all over the world. And I hope you people will do the same because that is why I do this show. I want to inspire more people to be out there roaring about the ideas of liberty, engaging in conversations with people, because we really are very lucky that we live somewhere, at least for all the flaws here in the United States, we do have the privilege, it's not really a privilege, it's a right, but we have a protected right for the most part. There are many issues we could, which we could go into, but for the most part, we do have the protected right of free speech. We are able to essentially freely discuss the problems that we see with the government and that sort of thing without fear of being tossed in jail. That is not true of many of our brethren overseas. Definitely not true in Cuba, and it's not true in Venezuela under the current conditions whatsoever. So I really do encourage you to look into more of these organizations that Zach mentioned today and the various ways you can help uh, our friends in Cuba and in Venezuela. I will link to all of the various organizations and methods of assisting that Zach mentioned during the show over in today's show notes, which you can find at lionsofliberty.com slash 398. A reminder that this program is entirely funded by our listeners. Well, for the most part, we do have some minor ad campaigns, but our day-to-day operations and everything that we do with this podcast and our ability to grow is entirely funded by our listeners. We don't take a dime from our Patreon, which of course you can find over at patreon.com slash lions of liberty. Please do consider joining the Lions of Liberty Pride for as little as $5 a month. You get access to loads of exclusive bonus audio content and at higher levels you get even more perks we have free t-shirts free beer koozies for the $15 level or higher you get our daily news links from our man Howie Snowden an epically amazing news curator so that is an amazing gift and of course at 25 or higher you get to hop on a monthly call with the host of the show and all of this money goes directly to helping spread the ideas of liberty helping to grow this program helping to send us to events like pork fest where we are going this coming June I highly highly encourage you guys to to check out Porkfest, and if we can reach the $1,500 level on Patreon, we are getting closer and closer. We're going to be able to fully fund a mini documentary about our time at Porkfest, which is great both to highlight Porkfest and the Free State Project in New Hampshire, but also great, of course, to highlight this podcast. Just another way we can get more content out there to help us grow. So again, if you are a fan of the show, please do consider checking out our Patreon at patreon.com slash Lions of Liberty. Of course, there are many, many free ways you can help this program. You can, of course, share this program on social media, on Facebook, on Twitter. Share it with your friends and family. Spread the word. That costs nothing but a few seconds of your time. And, of course, we can always use more five-star ratings and excellent reviews, especially on iTunes, because that is the primary platform where most podcasts draw uh, most of their downloads and listeners and that sort of thing from. So, very important to get as many reviews and five-star ratings as possible over on iTunes. But of course, review us anywhere you want. We'll take reviews on Stitcher. We'll take reviews on YouTube. I don't even know if that's a thing, to be honest with you. But we do post all our shows on YouTube for those of you that like to listen there. You can also find us on Spotify. So really, anywhere you can find us, I'm sure there is a way to rate us or subscribe to us. So I suggest doing it anywhere and everywhere, because the more the merrier, the more that helps us grow. And of course, as I mentioned at the top of the show... A great way to help us out and to help yourself wake up every morning is to check out our brand new coffee, the Morning Roar Coffee, our partnership with Anarcho Coffee. You can find that over at lionsofliberty.com slash coffee. You get 10% off your first order and you get 15% off any order forever if you join the Lions of Liberty Pride at $10 or higher a month. Maybe not forever, I suppose. At some point, I don't know. Who knows? We might be in a weird future where people don't even drink coffee anymore. Maybe we just take little energy injections every morning. I don't know. I don't know where things are going to go. But for now, if you join the Lions of Liberty Pride at $10 or higher, you will get a 15% discount on any order 
over at Anarcho Coffee. Lionsofliberty.com slash coffee. My friends, start your day with a morning roar. Start the day off right and start your week off right. Right here at Lions of Liberty where you can hear me every Monday, Brian on Wednesdays with Electric Liberty Land, and John every single Friday with Felony Friday. And until next time, friends, live long and live free. Are you tired of banging your head against the proverbial wall of politics and getting nowhere toward actually making your life more free? Are you tired of interview podcasts that have the same guests as every other libertarian interview podcast out there? Are you tired of hearing the same news stories that you can hear on the mainstream media? Then you need to listen to The Lava Flow, where we don't do politics and we don't do the major stories that exist only to divide you. We talk about news that affects you and your freedom, and we work to find solutions that can actually help you to be more free. Check us out at thelavaflow.com. Listen to We Are Libertarians at wearelibertarians.com. My name is Chris Spengel, and I host a show where we talk about the stories you and your friends are talking about, and then we give you libertarian solutions so you sound smarter when you're talking to your friends. We're going to make you sound like a genius. Tune in now at wearelibertarians.com. Are those dry, boring, run-of-the-mill political talk shows putting you to sleep on your commute or at work? Are you ready for some fun? Look no further. Blast Off with Johnny Rocket is a Seattle-based podcast expressing viewpoints of free markets, voluntary exchange, badass music, wicked banner, and of course, drinking. The Blast Off doesn't shy from the truth, but always brings the party. Let's rock and roll, Raylene. Bring it on, Johnny. You can check us out at thelaunchpadmedia.com forward slash blast off. Again, that's thelaunchpadmedia.com forward slash blast off. Launchpad Media. Always launching ideas in your direction.